So welcome to my presentation today. I'm going to be talking about how a cell phone call works. Uh, and my name is Matt Hurley, by the way, in case you didn't know. So the agenda today, what we're going to talk about, first we'll go through your introductions. I'll introduce myself a little bit, history of work. I'll get you guys to introduce yourself. Uh, I'll do a cell phone demo. I'll get you guys to get a print of a cell phone demo on the time and how long it takes to go through, so we can do those records later on. We'll go through a brief history of cell phones. I'll show you some pictures and then talk about cell towers. And then I'll talk about the communications of the different flows of calls as we go into the animated call flows, because I do have some of those too. Um, and then we'll follow up or end this session with questions and answers. Okay? Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. So, I started working for GTE back in 1999. GTE actually went over to Verizon a year after that. I worked in the 911 support area. Um, didn't do a lot of wireless at the time, mainly a lot of ground support equipment around 911. The cell phones were in and we were actually working on them at the time, but we weren't actually working on them until later. Uh, in November 2000, I went to work for Nortel Networks in the wireless cellular division. This is when I first got my hands on working on cell phones. Not cell phones in general, but the, the network that controls the cell phones. I did that for 10 years and then Nortel filed bankruptcy. There's some lots of so I've been working for Ericsson since 2010. I've traveled quite a bit with them. Uh, I've got to see all the generations of cell phones from the 2G to 3G and now the 4G to the So that's where I'm at today. Um, demonstration. So can you guys come up here please introduce yourself? If you wouldn't mind. I'm Maddie Games and I'm 14, 8th grade. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Ronnie Covert and I'm a cell phone at high school. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Hello, I'm Marcy Hubbard and I teach English at Marcus High and I am here to learn how a cell phone works. I'm super excited about it. Thank you so much. Alright, let's get going. Alright, let's demonstrate a voice call. So I'd like to get you guys to come up one more time, and we are going to make a phone call, and I'm going to record the time it takes for the phone call to go through. Just tell me when you're ready to send. Thanks. <laughs> 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 All right, so that took about 10 seconds. Sometimes it's just shorter. I've actually had phone calls go through a lot faster than that, but you know, that's your mental I think you're on Sprint Network and you're on Verizon, so. Uh, so, we have so we'll use that information later when I go through the actual call flow map and you see all the equipment, and you'll be amazed that it took 10 seconds for it to go through. All right, here's a little video that I found on the web that I thought was really cool. Uh, Cell phones. Millions and millions of people use them. With a cell phone, you can talk to anyone on the planet from right where you are. The cellular phone has come a long way in today's society. From the pager, to the first flip phones, to the more advanced, and to the extremely high tech. Question is, how do cell phones work? It's simple. Cell phones are actually radios. Extremely advanced radios, but a radio nonetheless. The telephone was invented by Alexander Graham Bell in 1876. Wireless communication can trace its roots to the invention of the radio by Nikola Tesla in the 1880s. To understand the sophistication of the cell phone, let's compare it to the walkie-talkie. Walkie-talkies are half-duplex devices. That's when two people communicating use the same frequency, so only one person can talk at a time. A cell phone is a full-duplex device. That means you can use one frequency for talking and a second frequency for listening. Both people can talk on the call at once. The genius of the cellular system is the division of the city into small cells. Cells are normally thought of as hexagons on a big hexagonal grid. This allows extensive frequency reuse across the city, so that millions of people can use cell phones simultaneously. So what happens when someone calls you? When you first power up the phone, it listens for an SID on the control channel. 
The SID is the System Identification Code, a unique five-digit number that is assigned to each carrier by the Federal Communications Commission. If the phone cannot find any control channels to listen to, it knows it is out of range and displays a no service message. When it receives the SID, the phone compares it to the SID programmed into the phone. If the SIDs match, the phone knows that the cell is communicating with its part of its home system. Along with the SID, the phone also transmits a registration request. The MTSO, also known as the Mobile Telephone Switching Office, keeps track of your phone's location in a database. The MTSO picks a frequency pair that your phone will use in the cell that will take the call. And once your phone and the tower switch on those frequencies, the call is connected. Now you are talking by a two-way radio with a friend. Cell phone technology has advanced tremendously in the past 20 years. It kind of makes you wonder what the mobile industry has to offer within the many years to come. Digital wireless technology. From then to now. Pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So that's a really quick brief overview of the cell, cell network and how cell phone works. Um, key takeaways from that actually was the MTS that we talked about. That's the mobile telephone switching office. That's for brains. Everything happens from the cell tower down to this office and then back to another cell tower. So we'll get into that. So brief history of the cell phone. Martin Cooper, the inventor of the cell phone, turned the cell phone turned 40 years old this year. April 3rd, 1973 was whenever he invented the first cell phone. He also made the first public call then. Uh, then he actually had a team of engineers that developed it and brought it to the public in 1983. So that's when it first came public. Uh, a little history about that. Uh, they actually had, see the phone that he's holding there, is what they call a brick phone or a shoe phone. And it was the Motorola Dynatech 8000. Phone weighed 2.5 pounds. It only lasted for 20 minutes of talk time and took 12 hours to charge up. So. And then once they, once in 1983, whenever the, uh, the reduced, the new phone came out, the actual one that went to the public, it was half that size, or half the weight, sorry, uh, but it had a pass like 4,000. So here's the history of cell phones. I just took a graph here and you can see that, you know, starting at the top, top left corner, this is the phone that, that I just showed you that he invented. Um, and then we just kind of go back and forth all the way down until we get down to the iPhone here. So I did bring some phones for demonstration so you guys can look at some of these older phones. So here's what they call a brick phone. That's one of the first ones, the Microtech flip phone. Hello. Yeah. Didn't show much about this phone on there, but this is what they call the back phone. The thing, the thing about this is when you actually travel with in your car, for the most part, it was a more powerful phone. It had three watts versus three tenths of a watt with these phones here. So these phones have a lot more reach than the portable phones did. But, yeah. This is what charged in the car, right? The back phone? The back phone did. Yeah. Alright, let's talk about cell towers. So there's different types of cell towers. And when I say cell tower, I'm talking about two components here. You've got antennas and you've also got the equipment which actually takes the information that goes over the air through the antennas down into the actual computer systems and then sends it over to the NTSO. We talked about a lot. Um, so there's different flavors. You've got uh, Hold mounted, you've got some mounted on top of buildings. Um, you can see some mounted on top of water towers. So there's antennas everywhere. This is a view of what they call hidden antennas. So they've made them into palm trees. There's a lot in California like this. There's some in Arizona with the uh, cacti there. Flagpoles. And basically what they... What Wait, they, so these cactuses are actually... Well, inside the cactus, actually inside these cactuses, there are antennas. So they, you can see they lift that up and they put an antenna inside there. So there's a bunch of different variations. I know some, some counties actually require that the telephone company do this because they don't want to have uh, cell towers just exposed and they look kind of ugly. So they've required them to do this, but it also costs about $150,000 extra to do this. So it does cost a lot. They've also made them look like bricks. And then the bottom picture there is not really a camouflage, but they do make them colored so you can match the buildings if you stick them on the outside of the buildings. This is the portable cell tower. So this is a little small semi-truck, and they take this to sporting events or to being used like concerts and such.
and they park this out front, they'll raise the boom up and you have the antenna, and they side that trailer is while they while the electronic equipment's out. So they can take this around, they call it a cow to sell on wheels. Cell phone communication. All right. So as you know, your cell phone, when you power your cell phone on, it's in constant communication with the cell towers. It knows where you're at at all times. And there's, there's a lot of, there's a reason for that, and we'll get into it in a minute. But basically what I wanted to talk about here, um, your, cell, your cell phone communicates over radio frequency, and radio waves travel at the speed of light. It's 186,000 miles per second. That equates to seven point times around the world in one second. That's how fast the signal is to back and forth. So you can't see these waves going over there, but it's really, really fast. Um, radio waves can pass through wood, can pass through sheetrock in your walls, um, can pass through glass. It can't pass through metal, it can't go through wire. But it does use buildings and metal as reflection devices. So like downtown and all when you're driving around or you're walking around downtown, they mount cell towers on the bone like I showed you previously, and these signals will bounce off the buildings. So you can get coverage inside towns and cities and all that just by reflections off top of buildings. So it comes in handy to have that as a reflection device and they use it when they're planning their cell coverage. Another good thing about having your cell phone know where you're at at all times is for 911. I call this triangulation. So when you make a 911 call on a landline phone from the house, they actually have a copper cable that runs to the telephone switching office. And they know where you're at the location because they you pay for that and you've got a phone number, physical location. With a cell phone, you're traveling around. So they have no idea where you're at. So what they do is your phone's talking to these cell towers, it takes measurements, and they know where you're at based off the three measurements. So if you take three different cell towers and know pretty much within a few meters of where you're located. It's a benefit to have that. It's also good for alerts. So you know you get the Amber Alerts or you get the National Weather Alerts. They actually will send the send the signal from the the, uh, the MTSO to the cell tower to broadcast the signal out, and everybody gets it. So it doesn't matter where you're at at that point. As long as you're a registered cell user, you will get the message. It's also good for a zombie apocalypse if it ever happens. <laughs> Here's a picture I have that I wanted to show you a cell coverage map, and we'll use this later on. But basically what it is, you see the red spots, that's your dense area, that's the most high power areas. So the closer you are to the cell tower itself, the better coverage you have. You get five bars, four bars, right? Yellow, but not as much, but you still can talk. But you get down to your two bars, one bars. You see the green areas there, you probably don't have any coverage. I said, what I'm using this map is just to show you that there are areas that you can't, you know, whenever you get out of poor coverage or you drop a call, it's because you're in the areas where you don't have coverage. And they're trying to cover these gaps, but it is expensive to get footprints out there. So it's, it's still in the building process. But. Okay, let's talk about the call flow. So basically what happens, cell, cell caller A wants to talk to cell caller B. Signal goes to the cell tower, goes to the MTSO, switching office, they look at your information, find out where the other person's at, they send that signal to that cell tower, and it rings out of the person which we saw for 10 seconds. So this is just a simplified version of it. When you power on your cell phone, it actually has to go through a process. And I'm going to show you a little animated map here. Of all the, this is the actual piece of equipment that I work on. So signal goes to the you know, B or the cell tower. It goes to the mobile uh, entity here. You have to authenticate. It goes back down and says, okay, you're authenticated. It sets up a uh, signal to get ready to send the signal back to the cell tower so it can connect you goes to the packet gateway system, so it actually has to get your IP address and all that, registers you, back up for authentication, authentication, back down, one more time, and this actually checks to see what all features you have available. And then authenticates again, it comes back down, it's going back through, it tells the mobile entity again, hey, here's all the information, find that person, we'll set up the path. There's your path. So all of that right there within a matter of seconds to register your phone instead of a data session. And so that represents the like the radio frequency that it takes. So from the from the from the phone itself to the tower's radio frequency, everything else is, is tied through either laying cables, fiber optics, things like that. Okay. And here's a little bit more. So this is this is a bulky call. So we talked about LTE. Right? So the next generation of cell phone calls is going to be voice over LTE. So 
here's a little, so the little piece right here from the cell phone to this section here was just looked on the other map. So all that's excluded. So now this is the other piece to make a trigger voice call to go through. So it comes up, has to go through the registration on here, goes across, finds out where the other person's at, goes through authentication over there, services gateway, finds the other cell phone user, sets up a voice call. So, there you have it. Any questions? That seems really complex. It is complex. A lot of pieces of equipment that you actually have to deal with and to make this little thing work. And if one part fails, it all fails. So, how is Volti different than traditional like LTE or like so, a traditional call? Because is it something completely different? So, like CDMA, that's or, or GSM for AT&T was a standard, the three tier one X they called it. Um, so that was just the regular voice circuit calls. It was uh, initially they had it over. Um, you had your connection going to your cell tower, and it was all um, actual signaling or, or um, copper lines running through the offices. Now everything's done through fiber and it's packetized. So it's kind of like uh, over the internet. So think of the internet when you when you send packets over the internet or whatnot. Right? It does this now through the cellular network. So you can get anywhere in the world, and it's a lot cheaper. For cell companies to do it this way versus having to keep uh, control over all the different uh, devices that it took to do CDMA or GSM calls. So it's essentially using data for the call? Yes. Just the, the, voice, the voice is data. So if you're in the city, then you're going to get better like, cell service than if you were like out because there's less buildings and things like that and less? It depends, right? So uh, there, there is other things that can cause you not to get good coverage and that's interference. So if you're thinking about these radio frequencies, there's other things that can actually interfere with that. Uh, um, fluorescent lights also emit radio frequencies. Um, there's other like uh, telephone, uh, television towers, they emit radio frequencies. So a lot of things have radio frequencies. Some remote controls, I mean, that's, that's low power, but all these things can actually interfere with your cell phone coverage. But yeah, if you're closer to a tower, it's gonna be a lot better signal. And you also have to take into consideration too that um, when you have a lot of users on the cell tower, so you have a huge footprint like we looked at. When you look at this, when you get a lot of users on one of those, that rent will shrink in because everybody's using the power from the side. So the more users, the less power. So if you're sitting here and you get a little bit of coverage, and all of a sudden you don't have good coverage, it's probably because there's a lot more users actually using the other power from the side too. So it's all relevant. But what I wanted to show you here, so you know, you use the, they have these maps, the top maps, the Verizon map, the bottom is an AT&T map. So they show you that these coverage maps, um, they cover most of the United States. But when you look at it at the granular level, some of those areas that are dark red look like this. So you may not, you may be in a dark area there, you may drop a call and you're wondering why not drop a call. It, it is because there are there are holes. Now, if you have a small green area there, you're traveling through, the system is pretty smart. They can't keep your information for a few seconds. And once you get into a coverage area, it will pick that up and you can go on. And you won't drop a call. But if it extends too far, usually around 10 seconds or so, and it's just, it loses it. You, have to, you drop the call. Thank you. Thank you.